If you have been on this channel for a while now, you know that the darkness cannot create anything. Only the light can create. The only thing the darkness can do is steal from the light and invert it. With that being said, when we see coercive control or cult abuse or high control organization abuse, we have to understand that with a lot of these cults, the main topic, the crux of the teaching often comes from true and authentic goodness. It's only the darkness, the tendencies of a malignant narcissist or a psychopath that can take that goodness, that truth, and invert and manipulate it and turn it into something harmful. Now, the topic that we're going to start looking at today is one that people have asked me to cover for a while now. And because of my proximity to the community that we're going to be speaking about, I have before this moment declined. But they do say that with great power comes great responsibility. And since I have found myself in the position of being a public figure, I do feel like at this point, it is important to speak about these things, if only to simply protect an innocent person from potential future abuse. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, a very, very special thank you to all of our patrons and our producers here on Esoteric Atlanta. If you would like to join our patron community, there is a link down in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce. And today on part one, we are going to be talking about Yogi Bhajan and the Kundalini cult. Now, as I said in the opening of this video, I have had people ask me many times to cover this cult. In my opinion, the Kundalini Yoga cult that was created and led by the late Yogi Bhajan is one of the most dangerous and destructive cults out there still in function to this day. I want to be very, very clear. And this is perhaps why I thought it was important to start talking about this. I, of course, now am running Shadow Work Challenges. Most of you know that I am the only female authorized Ashtanga teacher in the state of Georgia. I am a believer in the yoga text, the Hindu, great Hindu text of the Bhagavad Gita, the P P Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, the Hatha Yoga Pratika, but all these books have really created major impact in my life and major impact in my understanding of myself and of God. And fortunately for me, I have always had very good teachers, very integral teachers who never crossed a boundary into coercive control or cult behavior. But unfortunately, there are yoga cults. And one thing I want to make very, very clear is that when I talk about Kundalini Yoga, I'm talking about the practice that was specifically designed and offered by Yogi Bhajan. I am not speaking about actual Kundalini. I want to again make this very, very clear. Kundalini itself is the Christ consciousness. And the concept of Kundalini or the sacred fluid that runs up the spine is in every lineage of yoga. It's in Ashtanga yoga, it's in Iyengar yoga, and it's in Sivananda yoga. This is also a cautionary tale as to why it is extremely important to do your research, to make sure when you take on a teacher, you are taking on a teacher that comes from an ethical background. This is why, in my opinion, you should never be involved with the Yoga Alliance, nor seek guidance from a teacher who has been trained through the Yoga Alliance. Rather, you should seek the guidance and teachings from proper lineages that have the reputation of integrity and are backed by the scripture. Now, with that being said, we see Yogi Bhajan enter the scene in the United States of America during the hippie revolution. And it is my opinion, I, this is my conspiracy mind, I don't have any proof, but it is actually my opinion that Yogi Bhajan was created by the three-letter agency. 
It is my opinion that along with the hippie revolution that was also created by the three-letter agency, the controllers knew that the Great Awakening was upon us. They knew that people would start to lose interest, especially in the Western world, in traditional religions created by them, and so therefore they had to step in and invert, which is what the darkness does. But the difference with Yogi Bhajan and Kundalini Yoga is that Yogi Bhajan simply made everything up. Now, what do I mean by he made everything up? I mean, he literally made everything up. What you see with Kundalini Yoga is a very dangerous practice. We see a lot of spiritual manipulation, a lot of hyperventilation with the pranayama he uses, which causes definite cognitive disabilities in the mind, which can also be explained to the innocent bystander as being a spiritual uh, sensation when it's simply not now tomorrow i will be speaking with a defector from yogi bhajan's cult and i've already spoken to him on the phone and he in fact wrote a book i will place a link to the book down in the description box box below called confessions of american Sikh." this man is named garant singh locked up in india corrupt cops and my escape from a new age tantric yoga cult and i have spoken to grunt on the phone uh before doing our interview and um i i really just felt like it was necessary to do a part one first to get you guys to understand wh why kundalini yoga is dangerous why it's not yoga at all and again why in my opinion and from the evidence given by a lot of defectors yogi bhajan himself was a very nefarious person now, why it's also different is because Yogi Bhajan himself was part of the Sikh faith. And I had to do a deep look into Sikhism in order to understand where the corruption started at the very beginning. So let's look at the very beginning. Yogi Bhajan was born on the 26th of August in 1929. He was born in an area that was the province of Punjab, which is now part of Pakistan. Yogi Bhajan himself came from a pretty affluent and powerful family. His father was a doctor for the British crown under the colony of Punjab, which was run by the British. Bajan himself received his education in his hometown in a Catholic school, but was raised at home under a very strict Sikh tradition. The word Sikh loosely means a seeker or a disciple, a learner. It is a religion and philosophy that started in the Punjab region of India at the end of the 15th century. Today, it is the fifth largest religion in the world. There are currently 25 to 30 million practitioners. In 1947, a very, very violent partition happened where the area that was Punjabi was taken over and became Pakistan. Because of this, Yogi Bhajan and his family had to flee to New Delhi as refugees. Now, it's not lost on me how traumatic and horrifying this must have been for any person who all of a sudden had to flee their hometown in order to find safety and security. I know for myself, as someone who travels back and forth to India all the time, I have had to go through intense questioning about any type of connection that I might have to Pakistan. In fact, I have a 10-year visa. To India and my visa now probably has about three years left on it and once it's expired I will apply for another 10-year visa again in that process you are questioned by the Indian government on whether or not you are associated with Pakistan now you might think that's comical the first time I went through this round of questioning I thought it was comical here I am a blonde haired blue-eyed girl whose last name is Watson who grew up Presbyterian I have no ties to Pakistan, but that gives you a gives you an indication about how serious the situ situation is and still continues to be between India and Pakistan. So we do know that trauma affects people. We do know that it can can cause PTSD, CPTSD, and depending on the person, will depend on how they later respond to this trauma. So once again, I want to make that very clear. I understand that Yogi Bhajan's early adult life and he was 18 years old 
was completely horrifying. I know that that had to have impacted him greatly to lose his home, to lose his faith, to lose his Sikh religion. And just a side note, if you see the curtain behind me moving, that is my dog, not a ghost. Once in New Delhi, as a refugee, Bajan attended a camp college. This consisted of all of the refugees from the Punjab region. And from what I understand was very hastily put together by the government of India, which kind of makes me laugh. If, if, you've, if you've been to India before, you know that it seems a lot of things are hastily put together by the government. So this must have been a pretty stressful thing. You have all these issues between the Muslim faith and the Hindu faith. And now you've got this new influx of Sikhs added into the mix. And in fact, Bajan himself became an active member of the Sikh Student Federation in Delhi. Four years later, he would graduate with a degree in economics. By 1953, Bajan started working for the Indian government. He eventually became a customs inspector at the New Delhi airport. So uh, back to my original assumption that Bajan was a created person by the three-letter agency. Again, here we have a very powerful family from the Punjab region who gets lost in the shuffle of, of this 1947 great upheaval that happened between the Muslims and the Hindus that created Pakistan. And now we have a man who is working for the government of India. In 1968, Yogi Bhajan decided to try his luck at immigrating to Canada. He came to Canada under the understanding or the pretense that he was a famous holy man from India. Again, he was not a famous holy man. He was a customs worker at the New Delhi airport. In 1969, Bajan created his company called 3HO, and this stands for Healthy, Happy, and Holy. He founded it in Los Angeles, California. Now, something that kind of pissed me off, I was watching some documentaries on Yogi Bhajan and the Kundalini Yoga cult, especially since uh, Gurat, one of the disciples of Bhajan, just recently passed away in Los Angeles. A lot of stuff out about her and her purse. She had a cult within a cult, we'll just say. And a lot of these people talking about this said that the 3HO organization is very well known in the yoga world. No, it's not. It's not well known in the yoga world. Not at all. I had to look it up. I have no, I had no idea what 3HO was. Again, I knew, known about Kundalini Yoga, that it's a very dangerous cult. I've had an experience with that. I was actually attacked once, physically attacked by a Kundalini Yoga devotee in the Mysore room at one point in my life. That's how I knew about Yogi Bhajan's cult to begin with, because I have had an experience with somebody with a cult member. And um, apparently from my research, that's, that's common that a lot of these yoga cult people from Kundalini Yoga cult are violent. That's common that they get violent. And I don't, you know, a lot of their practices deprive oxygen to the brain. So, you know, there you go. I, I you know, but I want to say like, no, to all the other documentarians and researchers out there. No, 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 no. 3HO is not known by the legitimate yoga community. And I want to show you guys before we get into Sikhism, and before we get into the rest of the story, I just want to show you guys the website to 3HO. 3HO very much runs runs itself like the Yoga Alliance. All right. 3HO is, in my opinion, extremely dangerous. Again, this is the connection to the Kundalini Yoga cult. It's extremely dangerous. And what they do, they run their trainings a little bit like Scientology does. Now, I will say this. So when I go to India to practice with my teacher, there's a set tuition. Every person, regardless of whether you are a beginner or advanced student, pays the same tuition. For 3HO, from what I understand, my understandings, and we can talk more to Garant about this, is that the higher up you go in your teaching or the higher up you move up in your, your, your studies, you pay more and more and more and more money. This is identical to the bridge in Scientology, where you're paying all these thousands and thousands of dollars just to ascend. This is not legitimate. Also, we understand, find a teacher or a training, no legitimate yoga 
center is going to have a teacher training program. It's not going to happen. This is very much, anytime you see a teacher training, you're looking at a pyramid scheme. You're looking at something that is fake. And so I just want to get that across that no, no, no. Legitimate yoga people have never heard of 3HO. Never. My 17 years in this world, I knew about Kundalini Yoga. I knew it was a scam. I knew it was a cult, but I didn't know what 3HO was. So we see Yogi Bhajan starting his 3HO, which he explains to the government that this is a way for him to spread his missionary work. Because remember, he still convinced people that he is some holy man from India. So once again, in the 1960s and 70s, here in the Western world, Western world, we had the onslaught of the hippie revolution. This was the age of the flower child, dirt twirling in the mud, all that fun stuff that our parents and grandparents got into. Now, once again, I am aware and I do believe that the hippie revolution was concocted by the controllers. But I think the reason that they concocted it was to try to derail the great awakening that was to come. But because so many white people, we'll just be honest, white people in America were, were looking for something more. They were becoming seekers of a new spirituality. They clung to this yogi, holy yoga man that had shown up in Los Angeles. They had no idea that everything he was teaching them was, again, completely made up. This was before the internet. This was before the age of information. If Yogi Bhajan had come to America now, I don't think he would be successful. I don't think his cult would take off because now we have the resources to research people, to do background checks on them, to check to make sure they are who they say they are. Now, I want to make it clear as well that at this time in the 1960s, when Yogi Bhajan was picking up all these lost Americans, and, and bringing the, him, them into his cult, there were a group of Americans that had gone to India. There were a group of Americans that were starting to study with legitimate yoga teachers like BKS Ayengard, like Patabi Joyce. They were, they were themselves going to India in search of a real shala. So I want to make that clear that even though Yogi Bhajan was able to manipulate and dupe a lot of desperate people in the 60s, there still were some that found the right path. Another book that I'm halfway through is the book Premka. Pamela Dyson, who was Premka, who was Yogi Bhajan's secretary, speaks about this, about her finding this during the roaring 60s, during this hippie revolution. You also see, if you can see, I've taken so many notes in my book here of, of actually where you see cult behavior, or manipulation behavior coming from Yogi Bhajan. I actually have a note here. He knows how to control. Yogi Bhajan started taking these young students and basically trying to get them to not listen to their gut intuition. He had them meditate on him as their guru. Yogi Bhajan convinced a lot of these students to give up their jobs and move in with him where he would go on to rape a lot of women. Which is part of Premka's story as well. Reading Primka's book and hearing about this mass manipulation really, really upsets me. Because like I've said, I have been very fortunate in my yoga studies to have had very integral teachers. My teacher would never manipulate me or anybody else in the way that Yogi Bhajan did. I've never, I know where my teacher's house is, but I've never been to it. My teacher keeps very strong, firm boundaries between his students and himself. He teaches us certain things that allows us to go off and live our lives. He doesn't tell us to quit our jobs. He doesn't tell us who to marry. He doesn't tell us whether we should have children or not. My teacher keeps completely out of our personal lives. And if we do have a meeting with our teacher regarding something going on in our lives that we need advice on, all he'll do is speak to us in metaphor and guide us back to the scripture, the yoga scripture, so that we can make the decision that we need to make for ourselves. We also see the same type of, type of coercion control with Yogi Bhajan regarding sleep deprivation and food deprivation. The same thing we see in cults like Nexium. In a proper healthy yoga school, the teacher is respected as a teacher, but the teacher himself is not God. 
The teacher himself or herself has a deep and profound love of God, and that is why they are teaching these techniques so the student, his or herself, can learn these practices to help them in their own development with God. In a proper teaching, a guru or a master teacher would never stand in between you and God, which is what Yogi Bhajan did. We also have to understand that in the 1960s, I don't think people really understood what the term guru really meant. And I think sometimes to this day, people still don't understand what the, the label of guru means. The word guru means to transmute darkness to light. A teacher who is called a guru is usually a master teacher, a master teacher that's made it just to a certain point in his life to be able to turn around and help somebody else through that process as well. They themselves are not God. They themselves should not be the focus of any meditation or any prayer or any practice. They themselves are merely teaching you a template of how to find within yourself the alchemy of your own guru, of transmitting your own darkness into light. Yogi Bhajan would manipulate his students by telling them that they knew things about their past lives. In fact, in Premka's story, Yogi Bhajan was very, very forceful with her about certain past life experiences he said she had had. Now, this is terrifying to me because I have seen this behavior also in the truther community. If something doesn't resonate with you, it doesn't resonate with you. If there's a truther out there trying to tell you about your past lives and it doesn't make sense to you, go with your own gut. That's a form of manipulation. Because as we've said many times, cults exist everywhere. There's tarot card cults out there. There's tarot card cults on YouTube right now in our truther community. These coercive control, manipulation, malignant narcissists are everywhere. If you have a teacher that you feel like you have to walk on eggshells around, a teacher that is demanding all of your time, then that is not a teacher. That is someone trying to control you. In 1994, 3HO officially became a government entity. Now, Yogi Bhajan would go, uh, would go on to basically open up a compound in New Mexico where he would have these festivals every every single year and i'm telling you guys it's a fucking compound there are people that still live there yogi bhajan himself passed away in 2004 and when he passed away he was in a lot of trouble there were a lot of allegations against him for sexual assault robbery all sorts of stuff we'll we'll let grant grant singh get into that more in his discussion because he knows more about that stuff than i do but i just want to let you guys know that Yogi Bhajan literally created a compound, a cult compound. You, you can't get more culty than this. New Mexico became so proud of this holy man living in their state that they turned State Highway 106 into the Yogi Bhajan Memorial Highway, which again, we'll talk to Garant Singh about this because this is definitely something I think a lot of people are trying to get the government to not to like take down because he was not a good dude. But before we close out, in preparation for our talk with Grant Singh, I do again want to go deeper into the Sikh faith. Now, I took a long time to really study Sikhism in, in preparation for what I thought was just going to be my interview with Grant Singh. But but in going and talking to him on the phone and looking into this stuff myself, I, I did want to kind of do a, a part one just to kind of get everybody prepared. And I know, I, I said this to Garant Singh myself, I, I know that as an outsider looking in, there's only so much I'm going to understand, especially with Sikhism. And Garant himself is now a Sikh, an American Sikh. He has taken to the Sikh faith. There is a lot of issue between yoga practitioners and Sikhs. I asked Garant Singh about this in my phone call with him, and hopefully we will get into it in the conversation with him Um when he comes on my channel, but I wanted to kind of give you guys a background. Sikhism basically believes in one omnipresent God, which is something I think that all of us believe in that watch this channel. If you are spiritual, most people believe in this omnipresent one source creator. Basically, Sikhism is saying that no religions are correct, something that I also agree with. No religions are correct that God comes through everything and everyone. Sikhs basically follow the teachings of certain gurus. So again, we're seeing this power of the guru in Yogi Bhajan's background that will come out in his manipulation through his kundalini yoga cult. But the guru is just a master teacher. The guru is not God. The guru is not a God. 
Sikhs follow a book called the Guru Granth Sahib, which is kind of like their holy book. And this is what they call the living guru. So this is the book of living transmission. Once again, if you understand, if you have the education to understand what the word guru means, you can then understand why they say that this book is the living guru. Because what does guru again mean? It means the transmission of darkness to light. So in this book, in their Bible, so to speak, they have have the template of how to find God within themselves. They believe that you accept every human being as your equal because every human being has God inside of them, the fractal of God. And this at the time of the founding of Sikhism was quite revolutionary because we're looking at a country like India with a caste system. And even though the caste system in India is not legal anymore, it still exists. And let's be honest. Let's be fucking honest. There's a caste system in every country, whether it's talked about or not. But regardless of what caste, what socioeconomic background you're born into, every single person is equal in the eyes of God. This also was a big deal with women. Women took up very powerful roles in Sikhism too because they are equals. In fact, one of the main rules of Sikhism is something called Ik Onkar, which means there is only one God. Sikhs also believe in reincarnation, that there is literally no hell that you go to, like you're in hell basically, and your job throughout your lives is to find connection to source creator so you don't have to come, you work through your karma basically, which is a lot like, which funnily enough, and I kind of said this to Garant, like if you read the Yoga Sutras, Sikhism and the Yoga Sutras mirror each other. But the reason why I understand why Sikhs don't practice yoga, most Sikhs don't practice yoga, is because yoga in India is, is associated with the Hindu faith. Now, my views on yoga is that I love the Hindu faith. I'm very, I was telling Gursant because of the amount of time I've spent in India, I am, besides Christianity, besides the religion I was raised in, the second religion I'm the most familiar with is Hinduism because of the amount of time I've spent in India. I love Hinduism. I think it's a beautiful faith. And I, I, but I understand that for a Sikh, they see Hinduism as seeing all these different gods, which we know are all um, aspects of the same God as being a religion that has multiple gods and therefore is not in line with the idea of one God. But I also, he said something interesting too about why Sikhs, why just the idea of Sikhism and yoga not really working together. Anyway, he talked about, which is the whole crux of Kundalini Yoga, that, um, you know, Lord Shiva, which is one of the tri heads of Hinduism. So Hinduism has a dry head, just like Christianity has Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Um, Hinduism has Shiva, Vishnu, Brahma, the, the three. And Shiva, Lord Shiva, who is the creator of the Sanskrit language, is also the Lord of Yoga. He, he is the Lord of Yoga, but we also know Patanjali is the creator of yoga. So there's some kind of weirdness there. They both they both um, are incorporated with the, the rising of Kundalini. But anyway, from a, from a Sikh, from an outsider's perspective as a Sikh, they see yoga as something that is looking towards a specific God, where Sikhism believes everything is all one God. In my, in my opinion, that's just splitting hairs, tomato, tomato. I know most of my colleagues and peers that practice yoga who are like me, spend a lot of their time in India, know a lot about Hinduism and will go to Hindu temples, but don't consider themselves to be Hindus. Um, in my opinion, yoga transmute all religions, right? Because Patanjali in the Yoga Sutras never speaks about any specific religion because he, he just basically says, you've got nature, you've got the soul, and you've got God. And so, you know, that's where there's kind of some kerfuffle, I would say, with the Sikh community is like, why are we going to practice yoga when they perceive yoga as having this like God Shiva, which is not really true. I hope that makes sense. Again, we'll talk deeper about that with Gersant. But one thing, too, I found was interesting with Sikhism is they have the five, what they call the five thieves, which are the conditions of Maya. And we know Maya is a Sanskrit word for illusion. Now, this is also interesting because in yoga, we have the kleshas, which are the exact theme, same, same thing as these thieves. The five thieves are lust, anger, greed, attachment, and pride. This causes people to live only for themselves and forget they belong to the whole by giving into greed and lust. This is also what Mary Magdalene's 
gospel is about these five limitations that feed the ego and not the soul so interesting yeah now one thing i loved about sikhism too is that with every sikh temple they have like a constant what we would call a soup kitchen going on they're constantly feeding people and it doesn't matter what caste you come from it doesn't matter what religion you are part of every single person is welcome into a sikh temple to break bread with them that's really cool so one thing that sikhs do is that they wear turbans and I'm going to talk more to Gerson about this as well, because in my research with uh, Sikhism and the turbans, the reason why the men especially wear turbans is because in the Sikh faith, they never cut their hair. And so the term turban is used simply as like a headband, simply as something to keep their hair out of their face. So from what I understand from my perspective as an outsider looking in is that there's nothing of religious or spiritual significance to the actual turban again it's the spiritual significance is to the uncut hair that's being held back by the turban now we often laugh i i've there's somebody a documentary somebody called kundalini yoga kundaluni yoga because it's Basically, it's bullshit. It's crazy. But as you'll see with a lot of this kundalini yoga is turbans, the wearing of turbans. Now, I've laughed before about their bedazzled turbans because you see um, people putting like rhinestones on their turbans. And um, and again, we can talk to Gersant more about this because I feel like the wearing of turbans for kundalini yoga is simply a spiritual manipulation because again if you were to let's see if we could find more more uh, more uh, more pictures here so again if you like put on a turban like and you're taught that this is it's like it's like spiritual materialism now they also are told to wear only white now i understand that white is a very powerful spiritual color i know a lot of faiths will have you wear white but listen sister if you come to an Ashtanga class, you can wear whatever the fuck you want. I don't, I don't care what you wear. As long as you can move in it, there's no dress code. There's no, you know, don't come naked. Don't come naked. But, you know, you can wear whatever you want. There's no, there's no us and them. There's no uniform that's going to separate you from the rest of society. We also see with uh, Kundalini Yoga, which again, I'm going to talk to Gersant about, is this idea of wealth that a, a lot of kundalini yoga from what i see is they focus a lot on building monetary wealth now once again in order to teach you have to pay money as you go so it is going to attract a wealthy person like scientology because you have to pay to get more teachings um but they also kind of correlate material wealth with spiritual enlightenment which is so appalling because the two are not the same materialism is is part of is, it's part of um prakriti it's part of nature it has nothing to do with the state of your soul you see within the yogi, yogi bhajan cult people will will only buy uh white cars because they think white is some sacred color. Um, when you go to their festivals in, in New Mexico, they're put on very strict diets. It's it's just insanity. It's absolute insanity. It's 100% cult. And again, I do want to really, really specify that none of these practices that you're taught in Kundalini Yoga are legitimate practices. They're made up practices. And Garant Singh speaks about this on his YouTube channel as well, which I will share with you guys once we have him on the channel, where he talks about how yoga scholars have looked at Yogi Bhajan's teachings and have said, these are not yoga teachings. And I said that to Kursant myself. I did not know that that actual yoga scholars had looked into um, Kundalini Yoga. I didn't know that. But I have looked into it. And I have a vast education on the yoga text and nothing that Yogi Bhajan has taught or that is being taught in a Kundalini yoga class comes from any of the scripture. 
It is, it is completely made up. The mudras are made up. Again, they work with like the breath of fire as they call it. We call it a different breathing in Ashtanga yoga. We do quick breathing work after you have to finish second series. So you have to have done yoga for like 10 years, 15 years before you're even taught this breath work. But in people's first classes, he's doing things like fast breathing that's causing hyperventilation. That's all it's causing is hyperventilation. They're doing crazy mudras. You know, I know that we have a, a Kundalini yoga teacher that rents space from AYA during the day. And every time their class is over, it's literally a fucking wreck in there. It's a mess. There is glittering bedazzled jewels and feathers everywhere. You know, it's just shit that should not be happening, should not be happening in a yoga class. Again, I had a run-in with a Kundalini teacher a few years ago. I was actually teaching in a Mysore class. I was teaching Ashtanga as I was supposed to be. And in Mysore classes, as you guys know, we work one-on-one -on -one with a student. So I was working one-on-one -on -one with a student. And I literally had a woman who is a Kundalini teacher here in Atlanta, a follower of Yogi Bhajan, physically assault me in the class for teaching Ashtanga for doing what I was supposed to do. I know that sounds crazy, right? It's cuckoo, it's batshit crazy. But you have to understand, this is someone who has been following the teachings of a fucking malignant narcissist and doing breath work where her brain is not getting the oxygen. She's also paying a shit ton of money to be able to move up in levels in her own enlightenment, which is just not even a thing. So I don't think her mind is in the right place. I think after years of cult abuse, you will start to do crazy things that you wouldn't normally do. Well, anyway, I got physically assaulted. I was asked if I wanted to file press charges. I said no at the time. Maybe I should have just to hopefully stop this, this dangerous cult from existing in Atlanta, Georgia. But nonetheless, I decided not to file charges. And that is when I really started to look into just the shit show that is Kundalini Yoga. Now, with that being said, I know this was a little bit more of an informal episode, and I know that it was a little bit more scattered. I just wanted to give you guys a background into this. I do encourage you to do your own research. Please, again, know that no legitimate teacher is going to go through a teacher training, and no legitimate yoga studio or shala is going to offer a teacher training. So when you are looking for legitimate yoga and you are trying to avoid cults, yoga cults, that is your first red flag. Did your teacher go through a teacher training or does the shala or studio offer a teacher training? That, in my opinion, is your first red flag for cult behavior. Okay. I also wanted to get you guys prepared to look at these things because if you have any questions yourself for Krasant Singh, as we go deeper into the exploration of Kundalini Yoga cult with him, um, please ask them down in the comment section below so I can ask him myself. Once again, his book is called Confessions of an American Sikh. And then I also have this book, Premka, that both expose the abuses of Yogi Bhajan. And so I will put a link to both of these books down in the description box below for you to get. Once again, please, 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 as always, do your research. Do your research. No yoga shala is going to tell you you can only wear a specific color. No yoga shala is going to make you wear a turban if you don't want to. Actually, I don't think we'd even let people wear a turban in Ashtanga because it would just fall off and go flying across the room. Um, no, yoga shala is going to, traditional yoga school is going to make you pay thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars for your education. I know I put in the comments or the community board on my own channel a while ago, um, my tuition in India every time I go is like a flat rate of $500. That's it for everything. And that's what everyone pays. Every time I go, it's the same tuition. So if you're involved in like a pyramid scheme with yoga, red flag, big time red flag. Okay. So these also, if you're involved in a teacher that's making you like worship the teacher or making you feel like the teacher is the end all be all when it comes to your practice, another red flag. All a teacher is, is someone who's been doing this for longer and can help you avoid some pitfalls. That's all a teacher is. I would also encourage you to make sure that the teacher you're studying with has actually studied Sanskrit and therefore has actually studied the sacred texts themselves. They're not just taking what they've been given by their teacher and mimicking it, which is what they do with Kundalini Yoga. I just would really encourage you guys to be very, very careful. Um, Obviously, yoga itself comes from a beautiful lineage of, of self-help that comes from God, I believe comes from God. But there are dark forces out there that will twist that, manipulate it. Please, please, please avoid any type of high-controlled organizations. 
true yoga schools are not high control at all. Okay, you guys. And again, ask me any questions down in the comment section below. I, in my opinion, I would avoid Kundalini yoga classes. Again, Kundalini is in all forms of yoga. It is talked about in every single form of yoga. But if you see a yoga class that is called Kundalini yoga, I would ask to see what the teacher's background is. But nine times out of 10, that teacher is going to be a student of Yogi Bhajan. So that's very dangerous. You're in a very dangerous situation at that point. So anyway, all right, you guys, I hope you're having a wonderful day. Once again, the Hathor material and the Magdalene material will be back next week because we have a lot of awesome defectors from cults coming on the channel this week. All right, you guys, I'll talk to you soon.